<clears throat> Am I audible? Uh, yes, I can hear you. Awesome, fantastic. Well, hello everyone. Uh, for those of you that don't know me, which is actually quite a few of you, I'm encouraged there are a lot of people here. Uh, I'm Brian Bajak. I'm a visiting assistant professor here in my still only partially finished office at uh, Marquette University. And I'm very excited to introduce our next speaker. Uh, Professor Patrick Byrne has been a philosophy department faculty member at Boston College since 1975. He attended Boston College as an undergraduate majoring in physics, received a master's in philosophy at BC as well, and then his PhD at State University of New York at Stony Brook on Einsteinian physics. He has directed BC's Lonergan Institute since 2011. The associate director of the Jesuit Institute from 1997 to 2001, Byrne also was a member of the university core development and core renewal committees from 1991 to 2019 and a 10-year committee member for the Lilly Endowment Planning Grant on undergraduate student vocations, which led to the formation of BC's Intersections program. Among many other campus roles, he served as co-chair of the Task Force on Undergraduate Student Formation, part of the University Academic Planning Council from 1996 to 97. And since 1991, he has served as the university's representative to Lilly Fellows Program in Faith, Humanities, and the Arts. Pat Byrne has long inspired his students and faculty colleagues with a passionate commitment to the Jesuit Catholic dimensions of the university's mission. So it's my great pleasure right now to introduce Pat Byrne to give us our master class. Thank you so much, Brian. Um, I'm really uh, grateful and uh, a, a bit overwhelmed to be asked to be part of Lonergan on the Edge and with this very um, daunting title of offering a master class. Um, that's actually a little redundant because master comes, of course, from the Latin magistra, meaning teacher. So I guess it's a teacher's class <clears throat> that I, that I, at least I can uh, accept as a as a way of describing what I'm about to try to do. Um, I am, am used to working in Zoom. This is my first time doing Microsoft Teams, so I'm not sure exactly how things look to you folks on the other side. My hope is that you only see um, the PowerPoint slide that, that says Lonergan on the Edge of Discernment and uh, Self-Appropriation. Let me just ask, are people seeing anything besides that? Okay, good. My, my emails are open on my desk and other such things. So, okay. So let me get, begin. <clears throat> and let's see. So I, I, I want to give you an advanced pre of what I'm going to do in uh, my presentation. And the first is to make the overall point Bernard Lonergan's vocation as a Jesuit was really central to his entire life's work. Uh, the second is that there is an intrinsic connection between Lonergan's philosophical method of self-appropriation uh, and uh, the Ignatian spiritual exercises. Uh, his uh, method of self-appropriation is uh, central to really everything else he did in philosophy and in theology, his method in theology, and uh, indirectly also in his work in economics. And the third is that I'm going to take uh, a 1963 lecture that he gave entitled uh, The Mediation of Christ in Prayer to ex explore how, uh, how we might understand this intrinsic connection between uh, the Ignatian, Ignatian spiritual practices and the method of self-appropriation. In the essay itself, Mediation of Christ in Prayer, there are four technical terms that Lonergan uses, immediacy, mediation, self-mediation, and mutual self-mediation. The article is about uh, 22 pages long. The first 17 pages is Lonergan explaining those terms in terms of examples of watches, uh, organisms, and even uh, a discourse about uh, Hegel. Uh, that's not included here. What I've done is take really the last four and a half pages of the, uh, the essay, which is uh, his main point in the essay, and, uh, and to use his terms of self-appropriation to show what he means by each of those terms, immediacy, mediation, self-mediation, and mutual self-mediation. So hopefully, though those are technical, uh, abstract terms, and people reading this essay sometimes have to plow their 
way through about 15 of the 17 pages, and they kind of stop and say, where the heck is this all going? Uh, it's in the last four and a half pages that the uh, rubber hits the road. And uh, so I'm going to focus on that. OK, so with that, let me begin. <clears throat> So Bernard Lonergan's vocation as a Jesuit was central to his entire life's work. This connection would be far from obvious to almost anyone who had just begun studying Lonergan's writings, and it has escaped the notice even of some very advanced scholars of his work. Lonergan first came to prominence in the 1960s, and at that time he was known for his difficult and highly intellectual writings on insight, knowledge, science, objectivity, being, metaphysics, and his proof for the existence of God. Later, his extensive writings on meaning softened somewhat the impression of abstractness made by his earlier work, but even those later writings did not seem related to the tradition of Ignatian spirituality in any obvious way. Two notable exceptions among the scholars, however, were Robert Dorn and Gordon Rickson. Um, Dorn drew attention to the what he called the tone of insight, and its resemblance to the experience that Ignatius called consolation. As he put it, consolation is related to an illumination that insight can affect. In fact, this world is intelligible. Things do hold together. We can make sense of the universe and of our lives. We can overcome the fragmentation of knowledge. We can make true judgments. We can make good decisions. We can, we can transcend ourselves to what is and to what is good. Along somewhat different lines, Rickson emphasized the tacit importance of mystical experience found in Ignatian, Ignatius's life uh, as, as an important uh, dimension of Lonergan's work. Drawing from Lonergan's unpublished writings, Rickson showed that the Ignatian exercises influenced Lonergan and, and Nick Rickson compared him with other thinkers who treated mysticism more explicitly. This is not to say that Lonergan explicitly thought of himself as widening the scope of the Ignatian exercises, but there are several indications that Lonergan's involvement as a Jesuit with the spiritual exercises influenced how he approached philosophy and theology. He wrote explicitly about the Ignatian spiritual exercises in at least two places. One came in comments about a lecture that was given uh, somewhere between 1975 and 1976 that he attended about the spiritual exercises given by his fellow Jesuit Harvey Egan. Lonergan wrote, I had been hearing those words from the spiritual exercises since 1922 at the annual retreats made by Jesuits preparing for the priesthoods. They occur in St. Ignatius's rules of discernment of spirits in the second week of the exercises. But now, after 53 years, I began for the first time to grasp what they meant. What I was learning was that the Ignatian examen of conscientiae might not mean an examination of conscience, but an examination of consciousness. I was seeing that consolation and desolation named opposite answers to the question, how do you feel when you pray? So in, in that phrase, the examination of consciousness, I think you can see the root of what Lonergan meant by uh, self-appropriation. <clears throat> Here Lonergan came to recognize explicitly connections between his philosophical explorations of human consciousness and the Ignatian spiritual exercises, connections that I believe were percolating implicitly for many years earlier. Three decades earlier in notes entitled Grace and the Spiritual Exercises of St. Ignatius, Lonergan sought to understand how a revitalized theology might illuminate the place of grace in the spiritual exercises. He proposed that the spiritual exercises are concerned with the grace that makes people, quote, more fully and ever more consciously living members of Christ Jesus. According to Lonergan, this seemingly evident fact had been obscured by the state of theology in that day, which had lost its ability to illuminate scripture or life due to the influence of conceptualism, as he put it. Speaking personally, I had no no notion of the deep connection between Lonergan's philosophical method and his formation as a Jesuit until Mark Morelli published Lonergan's essay, The 
Mediation of Christ in Prayer in 1996. Morelli transcribed and edited this essay from a recorded lecture that Lonergan originally gave in 1963 at the Thomas More Institute in Montreal. In what follows, I will examine how this essay illuminates the intrinsic connection between Ignatian spiritual practices and the method of self-appropriation. Lonergan's essay is a profound exploration of what it means for Christ to be mediator. There is a widely shared interpretation of this Christian belief, which is called substitutionary penal atonement. According to this interpretation, Christ is mediator because he stands in between us and God, the Father. The Father is enraged at the sinfulness of humanity and out of his infinite sense of justice, wants to cast us into eternal damnation as the punishment we deserve. Christ stands in between the Father's rage and us, pleading for us to be forgiven. The furious Father can only accede to this plea if justice is somehow served. Justice is fulfilled by Christ dying in our place. Now, this interpretation may find some support in Orthodox Freudian psychology, but in my humble opinion, it's woefully defective as Christian theology even though many Christians for, uh, for centuries have subscribed to it. Many theologians have struggled with the tensions between this understanding of Christ as mediator and a vast number of important passages from scripture that seem to be inconsistent with it. In his essay, Lonergan put forward a profoundly different vision of the role of Christ as mediator, and hence those terms, immediacy, mediation, self-mediation, and mutual self-mediation. It is a vision of Christ as mediator of something that is immediate in us. It is a vision that grew out of his extensive scholarly work and teaching at the Gregorian University, and I believe also out of his formation in Jesuit spirituality. In his scholarly work and teaching, he studied the history of Christian thought about grace. Christ as God incarnate, the Trinity, and other related issues. In doing so, he often took the thought of Thomas Aquinas as his guide. But in this essay, Lonergan was not offering a course in systematic theology about these doctrines. Instead, he was communicating what grew out of his prior scholarly efforts. Because he was endeavoring to communicate, Lonergan did not begin with a theory about Christ as mediator but instead with something immediate about us as human beings. And he wrote, each of us is to himself or herself something immediate. One self as one is, one self in one's living, one self as existence, as capable of a decision that disposes of oneself and yet is incapable of an absolute disposition. It is oneself as prior, to, prior given to oneself, all the data on one's spontaneity. It is not one's thinking about all, of, about all that, but each of us in his or her immediacy to himself or herself. The immediacy to which Lonergan refers here is the immediacy of ourselves to ourselves within consciousness. The word consciousness comes from Latin roots, meaning to know with. We experience ourselves as given with and alongside whatever else it is we are conscious of. We may be conscious of a dog barking, but along with the experience of the dog's sounds, we are simultaneously and immediately conscious of ourselves as the ones consciously hearing those sounds. We experience ourselves given to ourselves in the experience of being humanly conscious. That is to say, we experience ourselves as gifts to ourselves. A few years earlier in his book, Insight, Lonergan emphasized this prior immediacy and givenness of ourselves to ourselves as the fundamental dimension of human consciousness. It is fundamental because, as he put it, 
if I did not have this immediate presence uh, to myself, you could not be present to me unless I was somehow present to myself. For consciousness is more obviously of this unity of ourselves as given than it is a consciousness of anything else. Being present immediately to oneself along with something else present to one is what is elemental and primordial in the experience of being conscious. Consciousness of oneself as such is merely experienced and merely immediate. What is merely experienced is mere potency, according to Lonergan's conception of metaphysics. As potency, human consciousness is open to all sorts of meaningful formations. As Aristotle put it, human intelligence is a potency that can become all things and make all things. But just what combination of intelligible meanings are taken on by any particular human being are open questions. The immediacy of ourselves to ourselves in and of itself does not settle any of these questions. Lonergan uses the term self-mediation to characterize the processes by which we do settle these questions of what we are to make of ourselves. At the most elementary levels, people are already mediating, mediating themselves simply in having sense experiences and in paying attention to them. In the most elementary way, people form themselves and distinguish themselves from others by the sense experiences they have and do not have. Moreover, human sense experiencing is never merely passive. People organize their sensations into a variety of what Lonergan called patterns of experience. People make themselves into distinctive selves that have had these and not those experiences, attended to some experiences, but not to others. But people further mediate the immediacy of themselves by the questions that they entertain seriously about their experiences and by the ins insights that they arrive at through sustained efforts to understand. They give themselves certain formations by having insights. They become persons possessed of certain kinds of understandings. They move from being persons of understanding toward becoming wise when they engage in the self-correcting cycle of ever further questions and insights. Beyond even this, by making judgments, people commit themselves to the truth of at least a few things that they have arrived at through the self-correcting process. In all these ways, people constitute and mediate the immediacy of themselves as given to themselves in consciousness. They mediate themselves into something meaningful and substantial, even prior to the self-constituting that takes place in deciding. By our acts of experiencing, understanding, judging, we are changing and making and constituting the same self that is present as conscious in those very acts. This is what Lonergan meant by self-mediation. This is how self this is how we self-mediate the pure potency of ourselves as given and become people possessed of certain kinds of experience, certain kinds of understanding, certain types of knowledge. These stages in the process of self-mediation constitute what Lonergan called cognitional structure. Through the spontaneous performances of their cognitional structures over and over, people attend to experiences and add answers to particular questions through insights and judgments. They make themselves into persons who have particular kinds of expert knowledge about a limited number of realities. When people operate their own cognitional structure, they make the raw immediacy of themselves into the mediated reality of the actual persons that they actually become. Lonergan's discovery and description of the movements of this cognitional structure was the primary achievement in his early use of his method of self-appropriation. But there's a great deal more to know to how we mediate and make the potentiality of ourselves into the persons we actually become. Beyond knowing the realities of our worlds and ourselves that comes from exercising cognitional structure, there are the still further questions about what we should do in light of such knowledge and who we should become. We mediate ourselves ever more fully as we come to insights about courses of action that, could undertake, that we could undertake 
in the particular circumstances in which we find ourselves. We go still further when we ask questions about what it would be good, whether it would be good for of the, excuse me, what would be the good of this or that course of action? Whether one course of action is better than all the other goods we might undertake, and whether indeed any of these actions is truly good. In and through this process, our feelings for values play the guiding role. Our feelings are properly attuned to what, if our feelings are properly attuned to what Langan called the normative scale of value preference, the guidance of feelings will foster authentic ethical discernment. On the other hand, if our feelings are distorted by self-centeredness, complacency, rage, resentment, hatred, or bias, then our distorted feelings will corrupt and derail that process. <clears throat> this is because our feelings of intentional response either reinforce or subvert our questions and judgments about the values of what we should do. Just as is the case in the self-correcting cycle of knowing what is real, so also the self-correcting cycle of knowing what I should do reach its proper limit when all further pertinent questions are answered and form the bases for objective judgments of value. Beyond that, the mediation of our immediacy reaches its culmination when we decide and act on the basis of authentic judgments of value about what is the most valuable and right thing to do. It is with our decisions that we ultimately mediate the immediacy of ourselves into the lives that we live. If we arrive at objective judgments of what it is right to do and act accordingly, we make ourselves increasingly into authentic noble, virtuous persons. But insofar as we subvert that self-correcting process and arrive at distorted and false judgments, or to the extent that we turn away from how we know we should act, we corrupt and disfigure ourselves and our lives. I have used the term structure of ethical intentionality to name this expansion of uh, Lonergan's cognitional structure in my book. And, uh, and there I try to show how uh, that structure can be extended into the realms of, uh, of ethical deliberating, feeling, value judging, deciding, and acting. It's by means of the combination of cognitional and ethical intentionality structures that people immediate, mediate the immediacies into the lives they live. But how will we decide to dispose of this given immediacy of ourselves? as Lonergan puts it. Uh, and that, of course, is the center question for this year's Lonergan on the Edge. How will we mediate the immediacy of ourselves as given to ourselves? What are we to do with this immediacy, this gift of ourselves to ourselves? What decisions should we make? As Lonergan puts it, we are already disposing the immediacy of ourselves even prior to deliberating, uh, deliberately deciding what to make of ourselves. Yet our self-mediation reaches a climax when we examine ourselves and deliberately choose who we will become. And this is also the theme and topic for Lonergan on the Edge. I'll return to these questions later on in this talk. Lonergan continues his essay by drawing to yet another dimension of immediacy of ourselves. He writes, Excuse me. <clears throat> now, in that immediacy of ourselves to ourselves, there are supernatural realities that do not pertain to our nature, that result from the communication to us of Christ's life. That is our reality, the higher part of our reality. It is something in us that is immediate and becomes mediated by the life of prayer. In other words, Lonergan identifies another dimension that is present within the immediacy of ourselves to ourselves. Our consciousness, our consciousness includes within it, as a part of our reality, as he puts it, a higher part that is somehow Christ's life. Eight years later in Method and Theology, Lonergan amplified what he meant by this dimension of immediacy dwelling within our self-consciousness. There he called it religious experience and characterized it as, quote, the dynamic state of being in love in an unrestricted fa fashion, 
without limits or qualifications or conditions or reservations, unquote. When people are in love, the experience of being in love is not always at the forefront of their, their consciousness, but it is always present. But when it does come to the fore, being in love is experienced intensely. Yet being in love in an unrestricted fashion is a form of consciousness like no other. No words can fully capture the immediacy of this dimension of our consciousness. As Lonergan put it in Method and Theology, to say this dynamic state is conscious is not yet to say that it is known. For consciousness is just experience. Because the dynamic state is conscious without being known, it is an experience of mystery, unquote. Still, it is a dimension in the experience immediacy of oneself to oneself. In other words, what Lonergan talks about is the immediacy of being in love in an unre un unrestricted fashion is not something that I have and it's over there and I have it. It is part of our immediacy. We experience ourselves as being in love. It is the immediacy of oneself that is consciously experienced as being in love unconditionally. For it is still oneself who is in love, who experiences herself or himself as present in the consciousness of being in love in an unrestricted fashion. Being conscious in this way, one is still experiencing oneself as immediately present to oneself in the immediacy of this mysterious experience. By the time of method and theology, Lonergan also shifted away from speaking of the supernatural dimension in our immediacy in terms of Christ to an emphasis on the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. He drew support for this claim from St. Paul's letter to the Roman, quote, it's God's love flooding our hearts through the Holy Spirit given to us, Romans 5.5. 5. While Lonergan shifted the language from Christ to the Holy Spirit, the immediate reality remains the same. The visible mission of Christ is the same as the invisible mission of the Spirit, namely to communicate the reality of God's unconditional love to the consciousness of every human being and to draw all humanity out of sinfulness into communion with the divine trinity. Just as the immediacy of ourselves to ourselves, the immediacy of ourselves as being in love in an unrestricted fashion also calls out for self-mediation. This means that as people deliberate, some questions about the course of action they are contemplating will inevitably arise out of the experience of being in love unconditionally. And just uh, to give a, a literary example, Flannery O'Connor is always talking about people who, and, and, and W.H. Auden as well, uh, always talking about people, uh, uh, or excuse me, uh, I meant Graham Greene, uh, always talking about people who are trying to run away from God's grace uh, and yet can't do their deliberating without being betroubled by God's grace. Um, this means that pe when people deliberate, some questions about the course of action they are contemplating will inevitably arise out of the experience of being in love unconditionally. People may, may fail to notice this aspect of their experiences as they deliberate, or they can try to repress it. A great example is uh, the character in um, uh, The Violent Bear It Away in uh, Flannery O'Connor's novel. But they cannot eliminate it from their experiencing. Um, uh, Green's um, uh, The End of the Affair. At the very end, he says, just leave me alone. But, of course, God doesn't. Uh, but they cannot eliminate it from their experience or its implicit influences on their deliberation. The history of religion reveals various and complex symbolisms, language, and scriptures that people have used to mediate and make sense of the experience of being in love in an unrestricted fashion. In Method the in Theology, Lonergan referenced the work of Mircea Eliada, uh, Friedrich Heiler, and others to indicate the manners in which uh, the mediating of immediacy uh, of religious experience has taken place over uh, thousands of years. But in his essay, The Mediation of Christ in Prayer, Lonergan focused on the ways in which it becomes mediated by the life of prayer. 
In prayer, people spontaneously use the same pattern of operations that they use in mediating the immediacy of themselves. Contemplative prayer is primarily a matter of absorption in and the intensification of the uh, experience of unconditional love. In the depths of contemplative prayer, one rests purely in that immediacy. But absorption in this mysterious experience also begins to work on and change the rest of one's feeling life. Among other things, it elicits wonder. People wonder what it means. They wonder about how to respond. Although contemplative prayer primarily focuses on these experiences themselves, at less absorbing moments in prayer, people start to emerge from the throes of love and wonder, and images and memories may come forward, modified and illuminated by that love and wonder. Even sensations may shimmer in the light of being in love unconditionally. Questions about these transformed experiences follow, and even insights may come to people in prayer. Frequently, these are insights about something one should do or insights into something about oneself. They include insights into and what, into what and who one might become out of this experience of love. Judgments and decisions also are sometimes made in prayer. People make decisions to implement, implement or to flee from the possibilities opened up by their insights. As people enter wonder, gain insights, make judgments and decisions in the light of the immediacy of mysterious love, they engage in the self-mediation of themselves as caught up in this immediacy of unconditional love. Lonergan held that the experience of being in love in an unrestricted fashion is immediate in every human being, whether they engage in the structured religious practices or not. That is, after all, unrestricted love, and this means it's not restricted to those affiliated with a particular religious tradition. Likewise, the immediacy of the immediate, the mediation of the immediacy of unconditional love does not depend on any particular tradition of spiritual practice. People spontaneously employ at least some of the operations of cognitional and ethical intentionality as they respond to the immediate experience of unconditional love. Nevertheless, the efficacy of the mediation of unconditional love can be greatly enhanced by spiritual practices. This is because spiritual practices are self-reflective rather than merely spontaneous. There's a famous story about a young man who asks the master, what is Zen? The master replies, we walk. The young man replies, but I already walk. The master retorts, but when we walk, we are aware that we are walking. The story is actually longer than that, as some of you know. It is this attentiveness and reflectiveness that differenti differentiates spiritual exercises from spontaneous mediation and prayer. In his essay, Lonergan develops this greater reflectiveness. And here one can discern the influence of Ignatian spirituality on his thought. He writes that in mediating the immediacy of being in love in an unrestricted fashion, what we mediate is Christ, not as apprehended by the apostles. It is our own apprehension of him. We put on Christ in our own way, in accordance with our, accordance with our own capacities and individuality, in response to our own needs and failings. It has its foundation in tradition and revelation, but arises from what is immediate in the subject. The Ignatian spiritual exercises are dedicated to discerning what it is that Christ is communicating to each person in all of her or his unique personality. The primary objective of the exercises is to assist each person individually in making decisions in conformity with God's will. But just what does it mean to speak of God's will? In his scholarly studies of Ignatius's spiritual writings, 
Jules Toner argues that according to Ignatius, God's will is, quote, to give us greater glory, which means God wills for us to participate in, indeed to be in union with the unconditional love and goodness that is the glory of God, the uncreated glory that God is. Ignatius construed his ex constructed his exercise to help people discover that this is really their own deepest desire and that this is what they themselves most profoundly wish to freely choose as well. At bottom, God's will is what humans would freely choose if only they could be liberated from ignorance and distorting biases. Toner shows that Ignatius understood God's will to be highly specific to each individual in her or his own uniqueness. God's will is specifically matched to the special qualities as well as the biographical and cultural and historical specificities of each individual person. And to that the specific decision he and she, he or she is considering. What might be God's will for a person in one concrete situ situation will not necessarily be the same for another in different circumstances. Toner puts it, Ignatius is not proposing a way of finding a universal moral principle. Ignatius is rather proposing a way of finding God's will for this particular person with this temperament and character with these gifts or limitations of nature and grace at this certain stage of development, physical, intellectual, emotional, moral, religious. God's will thus understood involves this person's relationship with God and other humans in the present situation with all its circumstances of place, time, culture, social structures, customs, and so on. It follows that the uniqueness of God's will for each individual is also deeply connected to the glory of God in yet another way. In choosing to act in accord with the glory of God, a glory that God wills for the person individually, that person chooses to play her or his unique role in the historical circumstances in which they find themselves. This involves the construction of social relationships, institutions, and cultures through which the glory of all humankind is being brought about historically. Any particular human decision is made in light of unconditional love, no matter how seemingly insignificant it is. When that is done, it is viewed as God, God's positive will regarding something to be done by that person, as Toner puts it. If the person actually chooses to act in that way, this decision constitutes the realization of God's glory in the whole history of humankind, and indeed the evolving of all creation. Once again, Toner comments. Sorry, I lost my screen here. The greater glory is not to be thought of merely in terms of the immediate consequences of a choice, or even in terms of the clearly envisioned long reign con consequences. But in terms of the consequences for the ultimate glory to be achieved through the whole of history. Thus, for Ignatius, God's will is situated in the context of an incomplete universe, an unfinished created glory, which is brought to realization through the glor great glory of persons who have amazing destiny and dignity of being God's intelligent, loving, free co-workers. Therefore, the habits of discernment developed in practicing Ignatius' spiritual exercises are habits of reflectively mediating the immediacy of God's love and the immediacy of who I am given to be. In mediating those immediacies, I determine what I will make of the gift uh, of myself to myself. Now, the very same cognitional and intentional structures of human conscious activities are inevitably operating not only in spontaneous prayer, uh, but also in the Ignatian spiritual exercises and in Ignatian discernment. For example, in contemplating a decision in the second week of the exercises, a person may be invited, uh, invited 
to imagine the alternative courses of, course of, act, courses of action in detail, and then to consider whether the feelings that arise in depicting each course might feel more like water striking a stone or water striking a sponge. Notice how the first step provides images of sights, sounds, and even touch, and then invites attending to the associated experiences of feeling. Subtly and implicitly, this exercise elicits comparison of the feelings, what Ignatius called spirits, about the potential courses of action to the feeling of being in love in an unconditional fashion. Next come questions for insight. What does it feel more like? And for judgment, does it actually feel more like that? Something similar happens in other Ignatian practices, such as the daily examine, the composition of place, or which is also by Ignatius called the application of senses to the reading of scripture, and the rules for the discernment of consolations and desolations. There is first an attentiveness to interior experiences. For the most part, this attentiveness brings about modifications in the constellations of one's feelings. But sometimes it is followed by questions that lead to understanding and critical evaluation of one's understanding of those experiences. On the occasions when prayer is seeking discernment about possible courses of action, Ignatian practices direct attention to the feelings motivating or spirits motivating the different options. Following the meditative exercises, Ignatius also directs attention to and offers cautions about, as well as exhortations, that is what he calls points, about making decisions, elections especially when it comes to choosing a way of life. These advisements stimulate the person to further consider questions until arriving at a sense of peace. While not explicitly stated, this sense of peace will be attained only when all further questions have been satisfactorily answered about whether the decision in question is in harmony with the unconditional love that God has given to the person or not. Um, yeah. So performance of the dynamic structure of knowing, deciding, and doing that Lonergan described does operate when people spontaneously mediate the immediacy of unconditional love um, and themselves is given to comp consciousness. People do this spontaneously, but they also do it more self-reflectively under the guidance of Ignatian or some other kinds of spiritual practice. There are, therefore, strong parallels between Ignatian spiritual practice and Lonergan's own method of self-appropriation. And it seems now apparent that Lonergan's own involvement with the spiritual exercises was an important source that led to this method. People do experience the gift of God's unconditional love, even if they do not practice Ignatian exercises or discernment. That experience does affect their other experiences, thoughts, decisions, and actions. But Ignatian and other spiritual practices direct people to pay attention to the experiences of God's grace and to direct them to attend to their own inner feelings and their thoughts and their decisions in light of that intensified awareness. Likewise, people also engage in the activities of cognitional and ethical intentionality structures without adverting to themselves as doing so. But Lonergan's method of self-appropriation guides them in applying those very activities to the experience of doing the same activities. It is, as Lonergan put it, self, uh, it, it is, as Lonergan uh, put it, self-appropriation involves a reduplication of the structure, the application of the structure to itself. Self-appropriation is ultimately a decision with a considerable amount of preparation. As with Ignatian discernment, self-appropriation begins by engaging the internal experiences of consciousness. In the beginning stages of self-appropriation, people pay attention to experiences of the activities of their own consciousness that play key roles in knowing, valuing, and deciding. They may have noticed, uh, previously noticed some of these activities, but few have noticed all of them. Frequently, people experience this intensified awareness, self-awareness with a sense of exhilaration. Self-appropriation next turns to the more challenging task 
of properly understanding and appreciating the broadened experiences of these activities. Even for, for those who are more familiar with the diversity and rhythms of their own interior experiences, few will have experienced the full importance and interconnections among those experiences and activities. In this way, growth in self-understanding and self-appreciation adds to what began as increased self-awareness. Again, as in the Ignatian spiritual exercises, people engaged in self-appropriation gradually discern that among the many activities of their own consciousness, a select few of these activities play a more significant role in knowing, valuing, and deciding than do others. The most significant of all such activities are the inquiring activities that arise from the unrestricted desire to know and value and the act of unrestricted being in love. Recognizing the presence and roles of these inquiries intensifies the appreciation of value of these most fundamental acts of consciousness and also everything else they influence as well. It especially intensifies the appreciation of oneself as the agent and subject of these acts. Self-appropriation moves beyond the experiences of oneself as performing the activities and adds the explicit insightful understanding of interrelationships that are comprised by that structure. Once this deepened sense of self-understanding and self-appreciation emerges, a person is then confronted with the challenge of choosing whether or not to, to embrace and foster uh, their value. This is a challenge of deciding whether or not to be oneself. It is the challenge to decide in favor of the immediacy of oneself as a knower, valuer, decider, and lover, or to choose instead some imaginary self or to flee altogether from making this choice at all. As Lonergan put it, this is the moment of realization that in each and every one of us, our decisions are producing the first and only addition of ourselves. I just draw attention to the intimate connection between this uh, pinnacle of Lonergan's method of self-appropriation and Ignatius's focus on the election of a way of life. We do indeed make or mediate ourselves in every decision that we make, but we do not always realize this explicitly. The practices of self-appropriation and the practices of the Ignatian spiritual exercises make this realization much harder to ignore. These practices intensify the need to deliberately choose to be oneself or to refuse. These practices place an existential challenge before us because they frequently intensify awareness of how much a person of a person's living has been at odds with this newly won self-appreciation. They reveal how difficult it will be to give up old ways and to form new ways of thinking, valuing, and deciding in harmony with self-appropriation and in harmony with the consciousness of unconditional love. The choices that this new self-appreciation presents to a person are choices for or against what Lonergan called conversion in its several forms. If self-appropriation is pursued consistently, then it tends to foster these forms of self-transformation or conversion toward living in fidelity with the value of being authentically a knower, valuer, decider, and lover. Self-appropriation then does not teach people how to perform these activities of knowing, valuing, deciding, and loving. Rather, self-appropriation begins from the experiences of them, which people have been performing all along. For a long time, people have been consciously engaged in and consciously immediately present in knowing, valuing, deciding, and loving, and trying to live ethically, and even in trying to avoid living ethically. They do this well before any explicitly guided exercises of self-appropriation. Nevertheless, self-appropriation does add something extra. It adds an intensified awareness, better understanding, deeper appreciation, and strength and commitment to the performance of what is best in these activities that people have been performing all along. Although everyone has been performing them for some time, few people have been doing these activities well, and fewer still people doing them with perfection. As Immanuel Kant put it so keenly, 
Quote, innocence is an indeed a glorious thing, but unfortunately it does not keep very well and is easily led astray, unquote. Hence Kant offered a critical examination of our reason in order to elucidate, refine, chastise, and strengthen its spontaneous but untutored goodness in ordinary living. In like manner, Lonergan offered discernment and, as self-appropriation to aid our already operative efforts at ethical living. It adds new levels of self-awareness, self-understanding, self-appreciation, and resolute commitment that will deepen their ethical work. There is yet another dimension to the self-mediation of ourselves as being in love and to the self-appropriation of ourselves as self-constituting. Lonergan pointed to the fact that our self-mediation is almost always mutual self-mediation. He argued that all human beings spontaneously use the same operations and structures of self-mediation, yet he also drew the attention to the fact that the materials and contents that we use um, are taught and that these are not always the same. In their processes of self-making, people draw contents from what was passed along to them by their families, their teachers, neighbors, and their cultural and religious traditions. They use these ideas, beliefs, feelings, and values that they have received from others as they perform the self-mediation mediating operations. Their familial and cultural, cultural institutions teach them how to attend to certain experiences of importance and to ignore those that are considered unimportant or threatening in their milieu. They offer resources to facilitate insights in the growth and understanding of those experiences. The inherited insights are especially needed in trying to understand how and why people around them behave as they do and how to get along with them. The ideas and beliefs and feelings passed down from others enter into the processes by which we arrive at judgments and form beliefs. Such inheritances provide standards of criticism to be used in evaluating uh, the behavior of others and ourselves. These ideas and beliefs once originated with some predecessors who first noticed, understood, judged, and evaluated such things. In addition to being recipients of such heritages, people also bequeath to others through their actions and expressions what they have come to understand, feel, judge, and believe. Every human being, therefore, participates in an extensive network of receiving and bequeathing that Lonergan calls mutual self-mediation. We do make ourselves by our conscious activities, but we do not do it alone. We depend upon others to assist us in our own self-making, especially the resources that they offer to assist us in our self-mediating activities. We, in turn, pass along further expressions that will enter into the self-making of other persons uh, by means of their own operations. Our self-mediation, in fact, is always engaged in self mutual self-mediation as we receive and pass along inheritances. So this is like the 17 pages in Lonergan's essay, and now we get to the point, the last four and a half pages, which in my is not actually four and a half pages. This long exploration of self-mediation and mutual self-mediation has been preparatory to the main objective in Lonergan's essay, the role of Christ in our mutual self-mediation. Here, Lonergan goes beyond his philosophical exploration of human consciousness and, and understanding and, uh, and appropriation into the realm of prayer. More specifically, Christian prayer, and implicitly at least, um, Ignatian prayer, as he puts it, is not merely a self-mediation in which we develop, <clears throat> but it is a self-mediation through another. One is becoming oneself, not just by experiences, insights, judgments, by choices, decisions, conversion, not just freely and deliberately, not just deeply and strongly, but as, but as one who is carried along. One is doing so not in isolation, but in reference to Christ. Consequently, there is an element not merely of personal development, but of personal development in relation to another person, Christ. 
in one way or another, Christian prayer is always undertaken in relation to Christ. Most basically, this means prayer in reference to the books of scripture. For example, in the Benedictine tradition, Lectio Divina, the attentive reading of scripture, is conducted self-reflectively with attention to the words of scripture that stand out with special prominence in one's consciousness on a particular occasion of reading. The Ignatian practice of uh, composition of place or application of the senses was built upon this Benedictine tradition, encouraging one, the one praying to put herself or himself imaginatively into the location where the scriptural passage took place and to notice how he or she is being affected. Already at the elementary stages of such practices, the person is praying, the person praying is engaged in mutual self-mediation. Already this is a self-mediation through another, insofar as the person is having new experiences that arise in response to the words inspired by the Holy Spirit and that came ultimately from Christ's own words and deeds. Sometimes prayer consists in no more than this, that we are transformed in our experiences and especially our feelings through our encounter with these words. But at times prayer also goes beyond this elemental level. Insights also can and do come forth as people pray along with Christian scripture. At other times, clarity about a judgment or a decision also comes about. For example, people receive clarity about resolutions to forgive and seek forgiveness and reconciliation. In all this, people are mediating themselves through Christ with his words and his actions in mind. Christ is guiding and facilitating and directing their self-mediations. Nor is this some kind of an alien imposition on people by Christ. Christ's influence on us in prayer makes us, makes us ever more keenly aware of our own agency of our own deepest desire, of our own authentic goal and true happiness. As Toner put it, through the mutual mediation of Christ in prayer, people discover what is really their own deepest desire. Lonergan goes on to insist that authentic Christian prayer really is mutual self-mediation in the fullest sense. This is because Christ too mediated himself as a human conscious being with reference to us. As he puts, put, puts forth so powerfully, um, I guess I don't have this quote. Um, a very real mutual self-mediation because Christ himself as a man developed. He acquired human perfection. The human perfection he acquired could have been very, quite different from the perfection that he de facto did acquire. By his own autonomous choices, he was thinking of us and thinking of what we needed to be able to attain, uh, needed to be able to attain our own self-mediation. Just as it is by relying on, adverting to the precepts, the example, the love of Christ, that we attain our own self-mediation with reference to him in this life of prayer. So also in the life of Christ, he himself was self-mediating with reference to others and the others are we, all human beings. Why did Christ go off so frequently to pray by himself, <clears throat> especially when crowds were clamoring for his approval and for his acts of healing. Lonergan would suggest that he went off uh, to separate himself from distractions, to pray about us, to reach clarity beyond what we think we want in order that he might be able to understand better who we really are and what we really need to become ourselves and what stands in the way of our becoming our authentic selves. He prayed as a human being to seek guidance of the Father and the Holy Spirit in order to gain human insights, judgments, and decisions about what words and deeds we most needed from him to become our true selves, to truly self-mediate the immediacy of selfhood and the unconditional love that we have been given. 
Ignatian spiritual exercises are filled with mediations on the life, deeds, and words of Christ. Exorcists are invited to contemplate what they have done for Christ and also to place themselves before the two standards of Christ and Satan. There are contemplation of Christ's birth, of Christ's mother, of his home in Nazareth, the episode of being found by his parents in teaching at the temple in Jerusalem and his Sermon on the Mount. But arguably the most profound moment in the spiritual exercises, in Ignatius' spiritual exercises, comes in the fifth day of the third week, which is the contemplation of Christ's crucifixion and death. Although such contemplation is certainly not unique to Ignatian spirituality. Lonergan emphasizes, uh, emphatically identifies this is the apex and fulfillment of mutual self-mediation between Christ and human beings. <clears throat> the human perfection that Christ acquired could have been quite different from the perfection that he that de facto he did acquire. If he sought the perfection that was suitable to him as a divine person, we would not expect it to have been the perfection of a person who lives a life of poverty and suffering, who lives in abandonment, unjustly and cruelly. Christ chose and decided to perfect himself in the manner in which he did because of us. We think of the cross primarily as the cross of Christ, but primarily the way of the cross is the way in which human fallen nature acquires its perfection. We attain resurrection through death because death is the wages of sin and death entered the world through sin. It was because he was redeeming fallen humanity that Christ chose to perfect himself, to become the perfect man. By his own autonomous choices, he was thinking of us and thinking of what we needed to be able to attain our own self-mediation. One can think of attaining perfection through suffering, which is the human lot, in terms of abstract principles of overcoming evil by good, of transforming evil into good, of the general theme of uh, death and resurrection. But instead of an abstract principle, we have mutual self-mediation. We choose that way because, as I said, we choose the Christ cross of Christ. If anyone would come after me, let them take up their cross and follow me. We think of the cross as the cross of Christ, but it's primarily the cross is something that belongs to all humanity. Christ chose it because of us, and we choose it because of him. In prayerful mediation about Christ's death, along with the reasons for which he endured it, we encounter ourselves in a very difficult way. We encounter ourselves as killing ourselves, at least spiritually, and sometimes even physically, often in really petty ways. We encounter ourselves as cutting off the self-mediation that would bring about the realization of the gift of ourselves to ourselves. We encounter ourselves as denigrating the gifts to us of other human beings, and of the non-human world as well. Lonergan wrote that human authenticity is never some pure and serene, secure possession. It is ever a withdrawal from unauthenticity, and every successful withdrawal only brings to light the need for still further withdrawals. This is what happens in Christian prayer, especially prayer in contemplation of Christ's crucifixion and death. We begin to have new insights, even inverse insights into ourselves. Our feelings begin to respond anew to memories of inauthentic actions with new feelings of shame and sorrow. We begin to form new judgments about what we have done and what we should do in the future. We sometimes even form new decisions. But we also encounter ourselves as loved unconditionally, loved unto death by the one who wants nothing more than to release us from our own self-destructive activities so that we can actualize the perfection that God in Christ wills for us. Rosemary Houghton once wrote, real self-knowledge of oneself 
There's something that people can only dare, only when love is broken through. Without love, self-knowledge must be rejected because it weakens defenses against the outside world. The unconditional love communicated in Christ's acceptance of death on our behalf reveals to us a love beyond all limits and frees us to recognize our inauthenticities and to begin to make restitution for them. Christian prayer is an ongoing unveiling of our inauthenticities and prompts us to mediate the immediacy of ourselves and God's love into growth, into fuller life. The practices of self-appropriation and Ignatian prayer both head us toward a common goal. Both lead us to an encounter with ourselves. Both confront us with a decision to authentically accept the gift of ourselves given in the immediacy of our consciousness. Ignatian practices of prayer heighten the intrinsic relation of our self-discovery and our decision to the communication of God's love through Christ and the Holy Spirit. Self-appropriation heightens our encounter with and, and our decisions for or against that self that is immediately present. Self-appropriation heightens our awareness and understanding of ourselves. It invites us uh, to use exactly those capacities to value and choose and love in a way that is authentic. People can and do become profoundly transformed through Ignatian practices of prayer with no reliance whatsoever on Lonergan's practices of self-appropriation. Yet that transformation can become sidetracked and even corrupted by pervasive cultural assumptions that undermine authentic knowing and acting ethically. On the other hand, self-appropriation um, in principle can lead to full human flourishing of authentic human living. But given the pervasive and insidious ways that dramatic individual, group, and general bias corrupt our knowing, valuing, loving, and deciding, this is impossible in practice. That is to say, it's impossible in practice to become a full human being by self-appropriation alone. Lonergan's essay shows the need for both forms of practice to mutually mediate one another. This is something Lonergan continued to uh, elaborate in his scholarship and teaching until it reached its climax in his formulation of a method for theology. That method of eight functional specialties spells out the complex details that need to be addressed to achieve the mediating and mediated phases of appropriating both the abundance of ways that God has communicated that divine love and the vast richness of being human. Both mutually enrich, correct, and reinforce one another. But the full elaboration of this is the subject for another essay. Thank you so much for your attention. All right, All right. thank you very much, Pat. Um, I, that was a great talk. There's a lot to unpack there. I, I guess we can't really all clap in concert, but I, I will clap for you right now. <laughs> um, Pat, thank you very much. Uh, so we've got a few questions in the chat and uh, I suppose ideally what I'd like is for uh, the askers to maybe read them or unpack them themselves, just so I'm not speaking for them. Uh, I can't tell if Liam is currently online, but he asked first. Um, so Liam, if you're here, do you want to uh, to articulate the question yourself? Or I suppose if he doesn't reply in a second, I will just sure, read it. Articulate it. Uh, awesome. Thank you. So. Dr. Burnham, thank you very much for your paper. I was just, when you were describing the Ignatian things, it really brought me back to a question I've been thinking of with Ignatian and Lonergan and stuff, just about how do you, what do you, there seems to me to be a dialectic about uh, between them, what you were saying with Lonergan about making decisions within the mediated immediacy of contemplative prayer and then what you get in the Carmelite tradition where you have someone like St. Teresa of Avila saying like, you know, if you have a locution, if you have something encouraged, which she thinks is just something encouraging you to make a decision in prayer, like don't disengage. When you disengage, go to a learned third party and ask them what they think of it. Or even more radically, um, John of the Cross's suggestion that I'm like, you know, when you have these locutions, you have to be aware that, you know, you're easily deceived because you don't 
tantrum, you're probably in some emotional rush and any attempt to try and make a decision within prayer would be kind of like in his words grasping at air so i was just wondering if you thought if there's anything maybe you could speak to how to reconcile these sort of two contrasting schools um thanks that i think that's a wonderful question <clears throat> i have to confess ignorance of the carmelite tradition um, obviously i'm pretty familiar with the ignatian tradition i'm also uh, i think fairly familiar with the benedictine tradition and i see an awful lot of crossovers between them. Um, <clears throat> so I can say a few things that I think speak to your question from the Ignatian tradition rather than trying to pretend that I know something about the Carmelite tradition. Uh, so um, Ignatius really, really cautions people against making decisions uh, presumptively, uh, especially if they've had very powerful prayerful experiences of consol what he calls consolations or desolations. He really, really uh, is very, very uh, skeptical about these. And this, to a large extent, came out of his own life, his own um, his, his own spiritual journey, uh, where he it took him a while to uh, to make some sense out of the spirits that were appearing to him. There's this, this famous thing of this multi-eyed snake that appears to him. And it takes him a while to figure out what that is and what it means. Um, Toner describes a really interesting episode where <clears throat> Um, uh, Francis Xavier comes to Ignatius with, with a decision that he's about to make. And, uh, and Ignatius prays about it for three days um, before he tells uh, uh, Xavier that, yeah, I think that's what God is calling him to do. Um, so it is very, very important in all uh, the spiritual practices that I'm familiar with to not act uh, presumptively uh, when one has had a powerful uh, religious experience in prayer. Uh, that sounds like the sort of thing that's part of the Carmelite. That said, at least in the Ignatian tradition, and, th and it's kind of funny, uh, Ignatius at one point almost seems to contradict himself um, after saying, you know, you, you should never act on a, a powerful consolation. There are places where he actually does. And, and in fact, um, uh, counsels Savior uh, about this. So it isn't a matter of of, um, uh, of prayer having nothing to do with the decisions one makes or the judgments one makes. But uh, there's there's a, a, a real stepping back and reflecting what I would call uh, the exercise of self-appropriation uh, in going from the, the power of the, of the uh, uh, spiritual movements that come uh, sometimes in prayer and not taking them Without, uh, without further reflection, which using Lonergan's language of self-appropriation is asking and answering the further pertinent questions and not acting until one has, has really uh, uh, reached the point where there are no further pertinent questions. So I don't, I don't know if that helps, but... Uh, well, that, that helps immensely because I think what you just described is almost the same as what John of the Cross would say. So that really does help immensely show that it is, I think, a dialectic of contrary And I guess I should also include in that, um, that although the essay that I was depending on to make my point about the intrinsic connection between the Ignatian practices and uh, Lonergan's more um, philosophically formulated idea of self-appropriation uh, doesn't go into this, I think Lonergan would be the first person to say that the mutual mediation is not just immediately with Christ or, or solely and directly with Christ, but with a community. Um, that, that, the, uh, that, that the prayer and, and the, the, the reflection and the decision making um, inevitably is always going to be made or, or ought to be made in a community um, uh, in which some people are, uh, are wiser in the ways of the spirit and others are still being growing in the ways of the spirit. Excellent. Thank you both very much. Um, so we, we actually have a couple of really interesting questions that have popped up in the chat. Uh, Jerry, are you here? Because I uh, you you can speak to the uh, the Jes specifically Jesuit side of things in a really interesting way. So I, I, I'm not sure I'm qualified to read your question for you. Uh, Jerry, do you want to chime in if you're in the, this, uh, the room still? I 
I see Jerry trying to talk, but I can't hear him. Can oh, no. Brian, are you hearing him? Is he muted? I can't hear him. He's all the way uh, in Rome. Maybe it's just taking a while. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> He's trying to mute and unmute himself again. Uh, uh, I'll give him a second and then if it comes through, I'll uh, yeah. obviously defer to him. OK, there. Yeah, it's very it's very low, Jerry. Testing. Can you hear me? Can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah, that's better. Yes. Okay. I think that my, my mistakes at a technological level this side. Um, I uh, would like to thank Pat first of all for an excellent talk. Uh, the, uh, I have lots of ideas, but I'll just stay to the one idea that I, I wrote on the chat room. Um, the, I feel uh, as a Jesuit, it has been a great privilege to uh, encounter Lonergan uh, and to intuitively recognize the Ignatian background that I have in common with him. So it, it's a source of, of uh, interpreting Lonergan, the fact that I have this background. Um, I'm aware that how few Jesuits, sadly, uh, are involved in the Lonergan movement now. Uh, I, I see 42 speakers. I wonder how many other Jesuits there are at, at this conference. Uh, the, so uh, the, the Lonergan movement is, is being brought forward primarily by lay people now, <clears throat> especially in North America, but uh, I do hope it, I believe that it is spreading worldwide. Um, but there, there remains, well, the, the specific thought I have is just a dream. Is there some way whereby systematically uh, the, there would be made available to people who are interested in Lonergan the possibility of undergoing the spiritual exercises, some sort of link with Jesuits around the world who automatically understand a qualification here. You don't have to be either Catholic or Christian to like Lonergan, uh, but it is one good way to work on religious and moral conversion. Uh, maybe just a footnote. I've had these conversations with Kathy, hey, Clif with Kathy Clifford in um, uh, Canada, who speaks about this also through the Catholic Theological Association. Uh, the and she sort of rebukes me and says that would be a wonderful idea, Jerry, but you'd have to there would have to be mobilized money for this. There would have to be funding for spirituality for lay uh, doctoral students, etc. Anyway, that's just a very practical point. Thank you. Um, I'm, I'm not quite sure how to respond to that. Um, I'm in favor of broadening the Ignatian spiritual exercises. Uh, I myself and my wife, as well as many friends, have had the opportunity to do those, but we are at Boston College, which you know, gives us a, a privileged location for doing that. Um, so yeah, I think, I think it's a great idea. Um, sure, thank you. Perhaps if there's anyone online here who is willing to put up the funding for such uh, uh, an initiative, please just contact Jerry and I'm sure he'll be happy to uh, let you know how to get that started. Yeah, I'll take some of that money. That'd be good. I'd, I'd like to do the exercise. <laughs> uh, Ligita, if you're still here, uh, this is another really, really fascinating question that uh, I think uh, merits quite a bit of uh, sort of further or exploration. So uh, is Ligita in the chat? I don't. I, yeah, I'm here. Can you hear awesome. me? Yep. Oh, thank you, Pat. Um, I had a question um, which I probably will read just for the sake of brevity. So in the, in the beginning, you mentioned that Lonergan did not give much thought to the experience of the spiritual exercises until Harvey Egan's talk. I wonder whether implicitly from very early on, he still thought very much in terms of the spiritual exercises. As the examples which you gave as your presentation unfolded also seem to suggest, and I'm speaking as someone who has an Ignatian background myself, my sister, um, um, brought up in um, Ignatian tradition. Uh, so, um, for instance, some other ways uh, to think of the goals of the spiritual exercises, exercises other than giving greater glory to God, which you emphasized, are to conceive the goal as human growth in freedom to respond to God's grace and as human growth in friendship with Christ, which you, which you mentioned. And it seems that Lonergan's early works are permeated with the sense of the centrality of these themes or goals. Uh, think of grace and freedom, that's Pelagia and me uh, wrote, freedom and grace, of course. Grace and freedom, a phonology with friendship and redemption or of Christ's self-mediation with us and his humanity as discussed in the mediation of Christ in prayer. Uh,
uh, there are some interruptions. Did, did you hear my question? I heard the question, but then there was a break, and I didn't know if there was something that came after that or not. We got, a, um, got the end of the end of what's in the in the chat box. Yeah, so so, so that's that's it. Uh, that's basically my question. Um, what do you think of of um, the in, influence, which is kind of um, implicit, perhaps? Because for me, as I started studying Lonergan, the links were so obvious that I was surprised to learn that he did not think of the spiritual exercises initially uh, much. Uh, that's that's a really good question. Uh, the, the, the thrust of my paper is uh, exactly along the lines that you said uh, without going into some of the details about grace and freedom and de redemptione, uh, which, by the way, you have done in exquisite detail um, in your dissertation and your more recent essay. Um, uh, I, I, you know, my 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 claim, without going into uh, making a full um, a, um, documented case for it, is that that in fact is the case that the spiritual exercises were very important in the development of Lonergan's thought. Uh, the self, you know, self appropriation is a term that he uses in Insight, which was finished by about 1955. Uh, although the, the text mainly focuses on self-affirmation, self-appropriation is kind of, in its fuller sense, is lurking around the edges all along. Um, and his work on, um, his work in Grace and Freedom, I think, made it possible to, for him to read Aquinas the way he did in writing the Verbum articles, which is where, and as he says, it was in doing that, that he found in order to understand Aquinas, he had to understand himself. In order to understand the mind of Aquinas, he had to understand his own mind. I think that was already moving in the work in Grace and Freedom, and certainly before that in his spiritual exercises. Um, I, you know, I like several others find it puzzling that it was only in 1967 or what was it, 19, whatever that was, um, when he when he heard that lecture by Harvey Egan, uh, 75. It was only in 75 that he could explicitly recognize that. I, I'm puzzled by that. I don't know what to make of that. Um, it's it's possible that um, it hit him in a new way. Um, that it was so. My my point really in the article is that this was imminent and operative all along, from very early on, and I'm using this 1964 lecture as a way of showing how intertwined those two um, practices, Ignatian and self-appropriation, really are, and how one naturally would have led to the other. Well, I shouldn't say naturally because it was kind of uniquely Lonergan to do it, but um, so, so, so yeah, that it was there, that it was influential. Why Lonergan had this very powerful reaction that he did when he heard Harvey Egan's lecture in 1975 and not before, I don't know. Um, but the gist of the gist of my paper is to show that it was there. Oh, thank you. Uh, I just saw uh, Gary responded. Um, does everyone see Gary's um, um, message? Gary, may I ask yeah. you? Th this this seems to suggest that the opposite is true. That actually they were, you know, they were very effective um the exercises i mean if he was he was so much influenced by them so the preach version of the exercises was effective in fact yeah, yes can i can i speak you can hear me uh, yep. The, yep. yes that's true uh, however um it's also the case that uh, it was the, the, I, i'm very aware of that harvey egan moment uh, i've talked with others a, a, about it it was a sort of a painful and moving moment for Lonergan because he, <coughs> he, he, he sailed a, a lonely path uh, in, in uh, moving from Ignatian spirituality through his own intellectual conversion um, thinking. He, he felt actually that he was a bad Jesuit. Uh, he, he felt the disapproval of his superiors for years when he was in formation uh, and uh, the so it, it like I, I imagine him moved to tears in the 70s uh, when only that late he realized that what he had been doing all along was more Ignatian than his authority figures allowed him think. Yeah, he didn't just feel that he was disapproved. He was disapproved. 
Yeah, he, was right. sanctioned. He, was, he was virtually cens censored at one point. Yeah, well, he was delayed for regency. He was kept for four years in a pastoral period where many of us spend only two years. And that had a lot to do with this sort of disapproval. Yeah, clearly, I mean, clearly there's a ton to unpack there. I, uh, I, I was familiar with some of that, but I didn't, I, I didn't know about the Harvey Egan moment. So that's really interesting. I'm, I'm cognizant of the fact that we're coming up on 1230. And uh, as someone who has to teach at one, I also recognize that uh, many have other obligations. So uh, I, I'm sure that everybody, if we could all clap for uh, Pat, we would in fact. So thank you very much for a really, really uh, stimulating uh, discussion, which I'm, I'm sure will uh, flower into further conversation. And I, whereas